we ask that any communication barriers be broken down. We ask that you will be clearly heard and clearly understood that all the words spoken here will penetrate deeply into our hearts. We ask, Lord, that you will be glorified. That it won't be about me, it won't be about us as individuals, Lord, but corporately. It'll be about us coming into your presence and worshiping you. Help us to sit at your feet, Lord, and learn from you. Help us to feel your Holy Spirit among us and in us. And help us to truly know your plans for us. In Christ's name. When you think of the word, we have up here a triumphal entry. When you think of the word triumph, what does that mean to you? How do you describe it? Victorious. Yeah. Something, something victorious, something wonderful, something grand, right? If, if I, we have symbols that we do, right? You know, someone wins in a ball game, right? They come, we're number one! You know, you know. Or, you know, V for victory. They used to do this and, you know, President Nixon, you're old. Um, there would, would be all different kinds of things, you know, the, the whole handshake or the, the trophies, the various kinds of things that say we have triumphed. Our memory verse today is John 12, 13. And it says, they took palm branches and went out to meet him shouting, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Now, today is Palm Sunday. You might notice that we have palms, seared palms there. People, the ushers have palms, waving them. You know. Everybody lift your palm and wave them around. Okay. Yay! Why are we raising... <laughs> Why are we raising this, you might say. You know, what is the big deal? Okay. It's a day we celebrate in the Christian calendar marking Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And the palm that you were waving there, that palm symbol, in the Near East and in, Med in the Mediterranean, it was, a, it was a big deal. It was a way of symbolizing victory and triumph and eternal life and peace. The Greeks, for example, when their athletes would win an athletic competition, they would be given palms. Hey, hey you won, right? Uh, the Romans used it as part of their, their goddess victory. She, she had a, a palm tree or a palm branches. It was always that symbol of victory. And um, only in, actually, is, although the triumphal entry is in all four Gospels, it's in the book of John that we actually see that of where they're using specific branches. The others talk maybe about branches or clothes being laid down. But in John, we, talk of, we see about these palms, these palms being waved. And it certainly looks like something as we read that triumphal entry as he's coming in and they're, they're saying, Hosanna, and all this kind of stuff. It certainly looks like something would be said to a conquering king, doesn't it? A conquering king who is coming in. Hosanna. What does that mean? Anybody know? Lord save us. It means save, right? Lord save us, save us from whatever it may be. Save. And it became an exclamation of praise at that time. You know, save, like save us. And they would shout it out um, to like a king or someone like that coming in. It actually goes back 200 years before that time. 200 years before Christ's triumphal entry. You had Antiochus IV of the Seleucid Empire. He had decided to ban all Jewish celebrations, all Jewish worship, etc. 
because they were conquering that era and that area, and he had decided to ban all Jewish religious life. You could not be a Jew. You could not follow Judaism anymore. That included that at the temple saying, no, no, you can't worship God. You have to worship Zeus. It's a big thing. And the Jews obviously were discontent with this. And so they had a revolt. They revolted against this. And there was a group of brothers who um, basically they, they took on the name or were given the name the Maccabees. Maccabee is from the Hebrew meaning hammer. And they came through and they formed this revolt. They did guerrilla warfare against the, the occupying Seleucids. And in the process, they won. They won. And they were able to free Jerusalem from under Seleucid rule. And they had this triumphal entry into Jerusalem where the people were raving the palm branches. Okay? The whole Hosanna thing. It was, it was a big thing. So this is two, almost exactly 200 years prior to Christ. And so what we're seeing here is the exact same thing. We're seeing that idea. We have another conqueror. This time it's not the Seleucids. Who was leading at the time? Who was in control? Rome was. And so the people have this expectation. Here's this, here's this new conqueror. He's going to save us. He's going to, just like the Maccabeans, he's going to save us from the Romans. So they have these high expectations. But what they expect and what they're going to get are two very different things. Which brings us to a very uncomfortable truth about Christianity. And it's this. Our expectations do not control God's actions. Our expectations do not control God's actions. Any control freaks in this room? Oh, I, I like it that someone a couple are brave enough to raise their hands and admit it. Yes. What is a control freak? That's a person who has to be in control all the time. I have my life planned out. I know what's going to happen now and now and now. I mean, I'm one of these people that, boy, I want my day. I start my day and I know I start it like this and this is supposed to happen and this is supposed to happen and this is supposed to happen. And if it doesn't go according to my plan, I get upset. Does that resemble anybody in here? Do you ever get upset if your plans are changed by other circumstances or other people? Why is that? Because we want to be in control. We, we think that we have to be in control. I, I mean, I may be driving my car and I'll have someone else in my car. Maybe my wife. Uh, uh, and, and I'll be driving one place and she's like, no, you need to, you know, and I'm like, the back seat's there. You can be the back seat driver. You don't have to be beside me, you know. And I'm not just picking on my wife. She's smiling, thankfully. <laughs> but, but it is the case, you know, we like to control things. And, and when we're out of control, we feel like we need to somehow get back into it. Right. thing is is that we often try to control God we often seem to think God is somebody this, this God who created the universe who created everything we somehow feel that we can control him which is ludicrous it's crazy but we do it anyway we, we try to make deals with God, right? Oh God, if you'll get me out of the city, if you'll help me pass this test. Lord, I know I didn't study, you know, but if you'll help me pass this test, I'll go to church every Sunday on time. I'll be here at 8.55. I'll be on time for church. Or if you get me out of this situation, God, I'll, I'll do this. I'll do that. We make deals. And then, if something bad happens in our life, who do we blame? 
We blame God, right? We get angry. We, we, we sometimes we're, we're not talking to God anymore because he, he didn't do what we wanted. He didn't act like we expected. And so, you know, it's sort of like that, that child, you know, the little one that they, 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 they say, I'm going to hold my breath until I turn blue. They don't turn blue. But they try. Yeah. What? We're like petulant children before God. And we try to manipulate Him. And we try to control Him. And we try to get things to work out the way we want them to work. We need to realize that. God's much bigger than us. And we were never meant to control Him. We were never meant to be in control. This tendency, though, to, to, to try to control is not, is not new. And it's not new in religion, either. I mean, do you remember in Exodus 20, do you remember what the third commandment was? Anybody? Okay. He's talking about not making graven images. Not making idols, not making any images of anything from heaven or in earth and not bowing down to them, not worshiping. Why is that a big deal? Other than God being a jealous God and not wanting anybody you to worship anything else. But why is it why can't we just make a, an idol or a graven image of God? Why can't, why can't we do that? It would like diminish his glory. It would diminish his glory. Because what are we doing? We're making it, right? We're fashioning it. And even though we may set it up on a, a pedestal and we may bow down before it and everything, we made it. We had control over it. And if you have control over something, you're in charge. And God's trying to get to us very clearly. You're not in charge. I'm in charge. We did not make God. He made us. And the creation is not in control. Look at Isaiah 29, 16. He says, You turn things upside down as if the potter were thought to be like the clay. Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, You did not make me. Can the pot say to the potter, you know nothing. I mean, some of you have done artwork. Some of you, did. if you make a pot, if you make a, you know, some kind of clay object, it doesn't have. Who's in charge? You are, right? Not yet. It doesn't control you. You control it. What we want control, and the crowd. The crowd that day in Jerusalem, they had definite expectations of Jesus. They saw this, who they saw as a coming king, and they had this expectation of what he was going to do. They wanted to make him an earthly king. Jesus is not going to have any of that. He knows what's coming. I mean, let's even look at the event itself. Let's look through it. Matthew 21, 1 through 11. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of them, of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David! 
Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred. The, the word here actually stirred in the Greek means like an earthquake, like a turmoil, like a seismic thing. It's shaking. And they asked, who is this? The crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. It was a big deal. They, they, they were looking. They had these expectations. And they would have loved, as I said, to see Jesus become an earthly king. And they had already tried before. Look at John 6, 14 through 15. It says, after the people saw the sign Jesus performed, this was the feeding of, of so many people, right? They began to say, surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. People want to be in control. They, they, they see a leader. They see somebody that has charisma. They see that someone has power. And they say, yeah, we want him to lead because if he's leading, we'll have power too. Right? But Jesus' mission was not to ride into town and meet the people's expectations. Far from it. So, is it wrong to have expectations of God? Should we not expect anything from God? No. We should expect that He's going to keep His word. We should expect that He's going to be trustworthy. We should expect that God, as He has been revealed in Scripture, is going to be true to that. He's going to be just. He is going to be righteous. He's going to be faithful. He's going to be loving. But here's the thing. Our expectations are human. And they are colored by our society, what we perceive as justice, whether it's true justice or not. What we perceive as Good, whether it's really that good or not. See, our expectations are flawed. And so when we apply human expectations to a divine God, they come up lacking. Because our expectations will never measure up. So yes, expect great things from God, from what He says. But don't put your own expectations on God. Because you're going to be disappointed. Because it's not going to be that way. We, we must realize that God's agenda may differ from ours. God's agenda, His plans, His purpose may differ from ours. Maybe not what we think. Do you have a bucket list? Do you know what a bucket list is? A bucket list is is a is a list of things that you want to have happen in your life. It might be travel. I, I want to see all of the countries of the world. It might be I in my bucket list, I'm going to get a house in the country and I'm going to retire there and I'm going to have a couple of horses. Your bucket list may be that I'm going to be the head of my company someday. Or I'm going to have my own business. You may have these things within your bucket list that you think that if I'm going to be a success in life, I have to accomplish this. These have to happen for me to live my life and end my life at the very, when I die, to say, I have done it. I have arrived. I have somehow completed this set of whatever it may be. That's our agenda, but God's agenda may differ from ours. At, at first, when Jesus came into town, it could be argued that Jesus was following a familiar agenda. Look at Matthew 21, 12 through 13. It says, Jesus entered the temple. This is after the triumphal entry. Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. 
It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you're making it a den of robbers. And you're saying, what does this have to do with anything? How is this an agenda? Go back to the Maccabees. This is exactly what happened in the Maccabean revolt. The Maccabees came in in the triumphal entry. Then, on their first acts, they went to the temple and they cleansed it. They made it ritually pure so that people could worship there the way it was intended to be worshipped in. Alright? So Jesus is following this pattern. And so the people are looking at that and going, oh, oh, okay. Just like the Maccabees. But Jesus' agenda is taking a different turn. By the way, backing up a little bit, do you know what Hanukkah is? You've heard of Hanukkah? You know, celebrated around Christmas time? It's celebrated in remembrance of what the Maccabeans did. That cleansing of the temple, the rededication of the temple, is based, that's where Hanukkah comes from. So, just a little bit of trivia. And anyway, Jesus' agenda, though, was, was very different. Jesus' agenda was taking a different turn. He spent the next week not going in and, and taking over and conquering people and making sure that the Hellenistic Jews were kicked out like the Maccabeans did. Instead, He spent the next week teaching and preparing His disciples for something completely different. His death. See, Jesus does two things that truly show how His agenda is different than what His followers and all the others around there wanted. First of all, look at Jesus' interaction with Judas in John 13, 21-30. You're at the Lord's Supper. It says, after he had said this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified, very truly I tell you, one of you is going to betray me. His disciples stared at one another at a loss to know which of them he meant. One of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, this is John, was reclining next to him. Simon Peter motioned to this disciple and said, ask him which one he means. Leaning back against Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, it's the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I've dipped it in the dish. Then, dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. Now notice these words. So Jesus told him, what you're about to do, do quickly. But no one at the meal understood why Jesus said this to him. Since Judas had charge of the money, some thought Jesus was telling him to, to buy what was needed for the festival or to give something to the poor. As soon as Jesus had taken the bread, he went out, and it was night. It's kind of a weird interaction, isn't it? Can you think about it? Judas is going to betray him. What would you do? Well, wait a minute. Let, let's talk about this, right? <laughs> yeah, I don't think you want to do what you're going to do. Jesus says, what you're going to do, do it quickly. Now look at his interaction after that with Peter. John 13, 31 through 38. When he was gone, Jesus said, now the Son of Man is glorified and God is glorified in Him. If God is glorified in Him, God will glorify the Son of Himself and will glorify Him at once. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for Me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I'm going you cannot come. A new command I give you, love one another as I've loved you, so you must love one another. By this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? 
And Jesus replied, where I'm going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. Peter asked, oh well, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Then Jesus answered, will you really lay down your life for me? Very truly, I tell you, before the rooster crows, you'll disown me three times. Jesus knew what was going on. Absolutely. He knew what was happening. He knew he was going to be betrayed. He knew Peter was going to disown him. He knew people were going to reject him and leave him. He was going to die. He was going to be crucified. He knew it. Humanly speaking, what would you have done if you'd been Jesus? You were in this situation. What should you have done? You, you see the future. You know what's going on. No way, man. Hey, Judas, hey, let's talk about this buddy, Peter. Peter, if Judas is going to do that, how about you and I and the rest of the disciples? We skip town, right? Let's leave. This is going down. It's going bad. That's what we do. Why didn't he stop Judas? Why didn't he tell Peter and the others what was happening? Because Jesus' agenda was the same as his father's agenda. You want to fail in your Christian life? Say, like, of course not. But I'll tell you an easy way to fail in your Christian life. Put your own agenda before God's agenda. If you think that you are going to be in control and put your own agenda first, you will fail. Because the only way to succeed, the only way to have true happiness in your life is to live the destiny that you were designed for. God made you. Every inch of you, every wart, every pimple, Everything on your body he made. So, oh, why did he make it? On the pimples. Okay. But he did. The Bible says he knows every single hair on your head. They're numbered. And as we've talked about, sometimes it's easier than others. But he made you exactly the way you are. And he's got a purpose and he's got a plan. He's got an agenda for your life. But when you try to go it on your own, when you try to live your life your own way, you may have temporary success. You may have temporary happiness. But ultimately, you will fail. Because you were never meant to be in control. You were never meant to be in the driver's seat of your life. You are a pot. You were designed for a purpose to be used by God. And until we get that, until we truly let God be in charge, we will not succeed. We will ultimately fail. When we follow Him, we will see triumph. We will see his triumph. However, you need to know this. God's triumph may at first seem like tragedy. God's triumph may at first seem like tragedy. You remember in the book of Acts, the church had been expanding. There were new leaders, and one of them was this guy by the name of Stephen. And at one time he was confronted with the Jews, by the Jews. And they were not very happy with him. And they stoned him. They killed him. And after they killed him, what happened? After this tragedy, the church, the people scattered as the Jewish persecution got super intense. They scattered. They left Jerusalem. Only a core was left in Jerusalem. The rest went throughout Judea. What happened? The 
the Bible says that where they went, they spread the gospel and it grew and it grew and it grew. It became more powerful from the tragedy. Stephen's death was a horrible thing. But it led, it led to the expansion of the church. And we know the story here. Jesus and his disciples, they finish supper. They leave. They go to the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus prays. And as he's praying, he says what? He says, not my will, but yours. I submit my will to yours. I, I would like it. He's very human in this moment. He says, I would like it if this cup, this, this destiny that I have for me would be taken away. But nevertheless, not my will, but your will. I understand the tragedy is coming. And if there's any way possible, I'd like to avoid it. But I'm still going to drink the cup. I'm still going to do whatever you expect of me. He knows what's coming. And we see in Mark 14, 43, 46, what follows. Just as he was speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, appears. With him was a crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Rabbi, and kissed him. The men seized Jesus and arrested him. And most of you have been in here, you've heard the stories, you know what happened. Jesus is dragged before the chief priests and council. They mock him. They condemn him. Peter is there. Peter's on the outskirts and people say, well, you were one of those, weren't you? You were with him. You're one of his disciples. And Peter denies him three times. And the cock crows. Then Jesus is dragged off to Pilate, who is the military, Roman military leader there. He's dragged off to Pilate. And then he goes to Herod. And then he goes back to Pilate. It's like ping pong between the leaders. Pilate finds nothing wrong with Jesus and wants to release him. But the, the Jewish leaders have so incited the crowd that even though they were going to release someone for the festival, and the other person that could be released is Barabbas, he's a murderer, the Jewish leaders incite the crowd to demand, free Barabbas, free Barabbas, and crucify Jesus. So Jesus is taken by the Roman soldiers out of the praetorium, and they, they beat him, almost unrecognizable. They mock him, they put a crown of thorns on his head, and then they make him walk the walk of shame. You know, he entered a week ago. He entered triumphantly. And now he is walking in shame toward his execution. And then they nail him to a cross. And he dies. Now, if the story ended there... <laughs> we would be right in calling it a complete and utter tragedy. But the story is not is it? Triumph is coming. Jesus is going to be resurrected. Jesus is going to rise from the dead. And we're going to see that. And next week, with Easter, that's what we're going to be celebrating. But we're not there yet. We're at the tragedy. And this Good Friday, we, we will be looking once again at the tragedy. The darkness before the dawn. Triumph is coming, but you might ask, why the twisted path? 
Why do we have to go through the tragedy? Because God's ways are not our ways. God's ways are not our ways. You know, the Boxer Rebellion in China at the turn of the last century was a terrible thing in many ways. There were over 200, around 250, maybe more, missionaries and the children of missionaries were slaughtered, 20,000 Christians slaughtered. It was terrible. Missionaries were able to come back. The church was struggling, trying to continue, and more and more pressure came. And eventually, the Mao Zedong took over. The Christian missionaries were kicked out. And Christianity was forbidden. God is dead. There is no God, etc. But what happened? All of the oppression, all of the persecution, etc., had the wrong, in the communist eyes, effect. The church in China exploded in numbers. Nowadays, even though Christianity is still kept down, there are, it's one of the biggest populations in the world are Christians is in China. God's ways are not ours. The way He works are not ours. We may not understand it. His logic differs from ours. Isaiah 55, 8 through 9. It says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. God thinks differently than we do. In some ways, I have to ask you, aren't you glad? Because quite frankly, if I'm in charge of the universe, if I was going to be your God, you would be in trouble. You would be. I would make a terrible God. You would make a terrible God. Sorry. You would. Because we're flawed. We're imperfect. And God is perfect. God is perfect goodness. God is perfect justice. God is perfect righteousness. And we're not. And His ways are not human ways. His ways are completely different because He sees the end result. He knows what's coming and He knows how best to get it. Christ had to die. He had to pay that ransom. He had to give His life so that we could have life. And it seems topsy-turvy. It seems strange. But God's ways are not ours. It's a strange path. But it's the right path. So i got to ask this question. Are you on God's path? Or are you on your own path? Are you trying to do things your way? Are you trying to live your life by your standards? Or by your family's standards? Or by your culture's standards? Here's the problem. If you try to live by the world's standards, you will fail. You will not try to find true happiness in life. You will not find true success. And you will not fulfill your destiny. Only when you follow God's path can you find true meaning in your life. True success. True happiness. And ultimately, true salvation. Our ways may look right, but they ultimately fail. And God may not always meet our expectations. His agenda 
may differ from ours. His road for us may be rocky and marked by tragedy. But we need to trust Him. You know why? Ultimately, He wins. And if we're with Him, we win too. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord, that with you we win. That with you we have a surety of peace and a destiny. And so I pray, Lord, for any in here that have been struggling with that, who've been trying to go their own way. And I just pray that you would help all of us just to turn our paths back towards you. In Christ's name. We pray. Before Jessica comes, we have a short video I want you to see. Close this up. Continue worshiping him through our tithes and offerings. 